delighted to and uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for making this possible. So thank you. So I'm going to talk about, uh, well, first uh, the background uh, in condensed geometry uh, to make sure that we are all on the same page. Uh, but please uh, ask if you have questions. Uh, so, um, so, um, You'll be talking about convex scenario. So I'll, I'll uh, introduce. Uh, I use this notation. The k will always be a convex body scenario. It is a convex convex subset of R n. With non empty interior, so such that the interior of the system for the So this will be the object we will be talking about, and we'll um, um, mostly be, or uh, at least in the first part, be concerned with uh, two notions uh, on this convex body, namely the notion of volume. So we want to explore volume of K and um, in short, I always write that. So I write volume of K like with this um, two parallel bars to make it. So that will be the volume of K. And um, I uh, hope there will be no confusion that it is the n dimensional volume of K. Um, and what is volume of K? Well, volume is nothing else but the Levesque measure of this set of uh, the Levesque measure in our. So that's the one um, object or one quantity uh, that we will be concerned with um, for convex bodies, and the other quantity we will be concerned with is surface area. Uh, uh, in the first part of the talk, it's mainly these two quantities that we will be considering. So surface area, okay, how will I denote that? I'll denote that like so. So by this uh, D here, uh, uh, that means, uh, so, so maybe I should write it here. Uh, this notation here is uh, denoting uh, the boundary of the convex body K. Denotes the boundary of K. And then the surface area, area of K, I'll denote like so. This is. Uh, Basically, I use the same you know, notation as up here, but now we'll have an n minus one dimensional object. So I hope that's not confusing anybody. So surface area, um, I'll denote like so. And uh, then uh, we'll be looking at, uh, to illustrate what's going on, uh, I often use two typical convex bodies to uh, illustrate what is going on. and. Uh, of um, uh, first convex body that we are always uh, going to consider is the Euclidean unit ball, which I'll denote like so. So that's the set of all x in our n, for which we have that you know, is smaller equal than one. So this is, of course, this nice, uh, you know, center of the zero ball with radius one. And the other thing where we'll test out uh, things that we claim uh, certain uh, things about is the affinity uniform. So that's the set of all x in our end, for which we'll have that the infinity norm, um, maybe I should write. So this is the max of uh, the absolute value of the coordinate entries of a vector x in our end. So I write between uh, one and um, n, so that this is normally <coughs> for one. And how does the uh, infinity uniform look like? It's, so that was the L2 uniform body in dimension two, and the L infinity uniform also in dimension two looks like so. So it's, it's also centered at zero and uh, has, uh, so, so it is a n dimensional cube in n dimension centered at zero with side lens two. So with these two uh, uh, examples, we typically check out, you know, uh, how, what we can expect uh, of those things that we um, claim certain uh, things about. So let's right away uh, look at the volume. 
let's take the easy one. So n dimensional volume of the on infinity uniform. Okay, so you have a cube of side length two in dimension n. So this is simply two to the n. And the surface area in, of the on infinity uniform. Well, we'll see. Okay, so now what we want to compute is uh, the n minus one dimensional volume of the facet of this uh, L infinity uniform. And each of these facets is a uh, um, uh, cube in dimension n minus one. So it is two to the n minus one for each facet. But then we have to think about how many facets do we have there. And uh, we will see that uh, the norms to the facets are uh, the coordinate direction and minus the coordinate directions. So we will have two n. And so this is n times two to the n, right? Um, and uh, for the L2 ball, we have that the volume is pi to the n over two for gamma, the gamma function, n over two. One, uh, which um, sometimes we, I, I'll use this uh, uh, in a little bit. So I want to write it, use the property of the gamma function and write it like so um, n gamma of uh, n over 2. So I use the property of the gamma function that gamma of n plus 1 is n times gamma of n uh, because at some point we will need this relation, which I'll write in a second. And the surface area of the L2 ball is uh, pi to the n over 2 over um, uh, gamma to the n over 2. I guess there's called L2 somewhere. So th those are the two examples that we are, uh, you'll be uh, looking at. And while um, um, probably volume is uh, much more familiar, I want to discuss a little bit more surface area. But before we come to that, I want to remark that we'll see uh, from what we have written here, and we'll use that occasionally, that uh, the, um, the volume is simply of the L infinity uh, of the L2 unit ball is simply uh, n times the surface area of the um, L2 ball. And we'll use that uh, occasionally. That's why I want to point that out already here. So um, it, we'll get this guy here, and I'll multiply this guy here with n, and I'll, uh, yes, yeah. Um, good. So now, um, let's, as I said, discuss a little bit this surface area because of okay, the volume pretty much here, it's your back measure. And uh, so, so that's now the first point I want to make it's uh, Minkowski. <coughs> So what Minkowski does is he uh, defines surface area as a derivative of volume. And you'll see in a second how he does it. He defines surface area as a derivative of volume. And uh, then, of course, one uh, has to check that if this is really giving us the right notion of surface area, as we may be used to it from other notions uh, uh, that we know about surface area. And it is indeed the case. Uh, but that's a very pretty idea to uh, define it as a derivative of volume. And in order to do that, I need to introduce the outer parallel volume. K in RN. What is the outer parallel body? We will look at K plus epsilon times the median ball. So this is the outer parallel body of K. So what's that? Here we'll have the plus here means Minkowski sum. So we look at 
I write the definition x plus epsilon y, where x uh, is, so this is just a vector sum here, the plus, where x is in k and y is in the integral. So let's look how this uh, looks like if we draw uh, a picture. And uh, the easiest uh, to uh, verify this uh, is uh, when one looks at the situation of polyphones. So I'll take as a picture to illustrate this, uh, the uh, L infinity uniform. Then how does this outer parallel body of the L infinity uniform look like? Well, to each point in the body in question, which is the L infinity uniform, for instance, to this point, I have to add epsilon times the Euclidean unit ball, so I would get this thing here, which is, of course, completely uninteresting if we pick a point inside the body. It becomes only interesting if we pick a point X on the boundary of the body, and we'll add epsilon times the Euclidean unit ball, and we'll do that for each boundary point here, and it is in particular becoming interesting when we are at a vertex of the polytop in question. So what we'll see is if we'll do that for every boundary point, what we'll get is this outer parallel body, uh, which looks like so. So that would be the outer parallel body of the other thing. Now, how does Minkowski define surface area? So, uh, so Minkowski, Traditional surface area it goes now as follows. And as I said, it's a derivative of volume. So he looks at the volume of K plus epsilon B02. It's the volume of this outer parallel body and subtracts K and divides by epsilon. So we see indeed this is a derivative of volume that we have here. And then he looks at the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So this is indeed a derivative of volume, and that is his definition of surface area. But let's convince ourselves that this is really doing what it's supposed to do and gives us indeed the surface area. So to see that, let's look at our uh, example that we picked, which is the L infinity uniform. So uh, we have to look at the out parallel body, which we had already drawn up here. And um, it looks like so. So this is K plus epsilon PN2 for uh, our polytop for our L infinity uh, unit ball. But we could draw the same picture uh, for any other. Uh, say polytop or general convex body. So um, let's uh, stay first with the situation of polytops. So let K, let's, let me uh, keep the notation K. So let K be a polytop. For instance, this L infinity uniform uh, with facets. So those are the n minus one dimensional faces of i, one less or equal i, less or equal i. And for that, we want to check now if this is a reasonable definition of surface area, this Minkowski definition. That's what we want to do for uh, a polytop with facets f1 up to f1, like this example here of the L infinity. Now the general case will then be followed will then follow by approximation by polytops. So it's enough actually to check that this is a reasonable definition for our surface area if we look at the case of polytops. Okay, so then uh, what we have here, well, we'll have here this outer parallel body, which we can decompose in a disjoint or disjoint union of the body itself. Well, disjoint, I mean disjoint in the sense that the intersection is only of, of lower dimensional uh, uh, sets that have measured, Lebesgue measure zero if for the full dimensional Lebesgue measure. So disjoint union with well, these parts that are above the n minus one dimensional facets. And notice here we have this height epsilon. So disjoint union of everybody that is above this n minus one dimensional facets. 
Well, my picture is not too great. I should probably put further down here. Um, um, right? We are good. So um, those passages, it's this passage here, that, you know, it's here, this passage here, it's here. And then comes the disjoint union of the n what about the n minus two dimensional facets and so on till we arrive at well in this picture we already arrived at what's about the vertices which are those uh, parts which are those parts here right so that's what we get good <coughs> so we are seeing if we want to now come to our expression here, where we look at the volume of this outer parallel body, this is simply what the volume of A, because we use uh, uh, the uh, uh, properties of measure, because we have, so to speak, this joint union of uh, A, plus now comes, well, now comes the sum over all those parts here that are above the facet. So I have to sum up everybody that is above the facets. We'll have M facets. So I have to look at the sum I goes from one to N. And then the N minus one dimensional volume of such a facet here of I times epsilon. Everybody good? Yeah. And then we don't even care what comes next. But uh, I'll just write plus higher order terms in epsilon because we see, okay, I would have to look at those parts here where we have this part of the ball with radius epsilon. So in dimension two, that gets a factor of epsilon squared. Okay? So now uh, let's march towards here. So what we have to do is if we look at Minkowski definition, is at this volume minus the volume of K, and then we'll divide by epsilon, which on the right hand side simply leaves us the sum of the n minus one dimensional volume of the facets. And now, uh, as epsilon goes to zero, it's exactly that expression that we get because the higher order terms will disappear. And this is intuitively what we understand to be the surface area of such a polygon, right? So this is really a good definition of surface area. <clears throat> is it better if I start? It, I guess it doesn't matter if I start with this point or anything. So I, I continue here. So now, uh, so, so we have these two notions of volume and surface area, and there is uh, actually, um, and that's my second point, uh, an important inequality which relates these two quantities, which is the isoperimetric inequality. So that's the next point that we want to talk about, the isoperimetric inequality which relates these two quantities, surface area and volume. So what does isoperimetric inequality say? So K is again, convex body in Rn. You say uh, there is more general formulation for isoperimetric inequality, but we will stay with a set of convex bodies. So then the isoperimetric inequality says that the surface area of K divided by the volume of K to the power N minus one over N, We'll have to write the right homogeneity factor. Um, surface area is homogeneous of degree n minus one, and volume is homogeneous of degree n. So this is a uh, uh, bigger equal than the uh, surface area of the ball divided by the corresponding volume of the ball. And again, we'll have to uh, write the right homogeneity here with equality. If and only if K is a ball. 
And uh, there are many proofs of the isoperimetic inequality. For instance, one proof goes to Steiner-symmetrization, but I don't want to talk about that. What I want to give a, a proof, which is very short, uh, once one accepts uh, the next inequality, so short proof or quick proof, with um, uh, the, the full Minkowski inequality. So what does Brunning-Hosky inequality say? Um, so we want to give a quick proof of the isoperimetric inequality using Brunning-Hosky inequality. So what does Brunning-Hosky inequality say? Let's look at convex bodies uh, AB. We look at two convex bodies A and B in our end. Then Kulminkowski inequality says that the volume of the body A to the power one over n, oh, sorry, the so volume of the Minkowski sum of A and B, so this is Minkowski sum of the two bodies, raised to the power one over n is bigger equal than the volume of the body A raised to the power one over n plus the volume of the body B raised to the power one over n with equality, maybe I'll put this up a little bit already, with equality if and only if A and B are homothetic. So what does it mean A and B are homothetic? It means, oh, can you guys see if I'm, yeah. So that is there exists uh, lambda positive or should be positive, otherwise we might get a uh, you know a uh, set uh, that has no um, uh, has no measure or has measure zero. And um uh, back to A in our and sorry to squeeze stuff like so in the corner, such that such that A is a multiple of B modulo uh, a possible shift, right? So that means that A and B are common. I'll put it up and uh, one can read it. So uh, this is um, uh, the Bunning-Kowski inequality. And um, yeah, let's now see how we can use this inequality to prove the isoperimetric So uh, we will see that this expression that appear in the Bunning-Kowski inequality are actually perfectly targeted to our definition of um, uh, surface area uh, of a convex body, right? Um, so we'll apply, also we look at what's here um, appearing in our definition of the Minkowski definition of surface area. We look at the volume of uh, this guy here. And we know by putting by putting cost inequality that this is bigger or equal than the volume of k to the one over n. So this is just putting cost inequality that I apply here. So Kolmikowski tells us that this is bigger or equal than the volume of k that uh, would correspond to our a to the power of uh, one over n plus epsilon volume of the Euclidean unit or to the power of one. Over n. Okay. So and that's the same as saying that now we will take we both don't want this power one over n here, so we'll raise both uh, sides to the power n. So we'll get k one over n plus epsilon volume of the period or one over n, and the whole thing to be n. That is, if we uh, use binomial formula, this is volume of k plus, and then comes volume of k to the uh, n minus one over n times epsilon volume of the Euclidean unit form to the one over n. And check that I applied binomial formula correctly. And uh, yeah, I'm losing the job. Um, and then I don't care what comes uh, afterwards. So I'll just write higher order terms. In 
So we get this. And now what we will do is because we want to prove uh, the isoperimetric electron. So we want to bring in the surface area of K. This we will see we can do perfectly now. We do it bringing it in, that is the surface area, bringing it in in uh, the form of Minkowski definition of surface area, because I look at my left hand side and I subtract K here. Then um, let me also right away divide by epsilon. Okay. Then this is bigger or equal than what we are uh, uh, left with here. So that would be um, K n minus one over n. We divide it by epsilon times the uh, volume of the Euclidean uniform to the one over n plus higher order terms. Higher order terms. Now here I have a term epsilon to the zero. So higher order than zero terms in epsilon. And then we will let epsilon go to zero on both sides. And uh, so epsilon goes to zero. On the uh, left-hand side, we will end up with the surface area according to Minkowski. This is bigger or equal than these terms, the higher order terms disappear. And um, so now it's a bit, uh, so I can right away, I hope you don't mind if I now right away divide by this uh, at the same time by this volume of k to the n minus one over n missing on the right. I think there's an n missing on the right. Uh, there is an n, absolutely. There should be an n because we use binomial formulas. See, I told you guys, we check that I apply correctly binomial formula. Thank you. So uh, we forgot the end, which we you know needed uh, because I mentioned here we want to see relation. That's why I mentioned it over there. And then I forgot it here. So we'll have the end here. And um, so we divide it. Uh, by the volume, then that left leaves us with n volume of the Euclidean unit ball to the one over n. And uh, let me also bring in right away that the term we want to get the homo right homogeneity. This is the term volume of the Euclidean unit ball n minus one over n, but then we have a, made a mistake. So n minus one over n. Uh, so this goes away the power and we'll end up in volume of the Euclidean unit ball divided by volume of the Euclidean unit ball to the n minus one over n. But from what we have seen over there, this is nothing else but the surface area of the Euclidean unit ball, volume of the Euclidean unit ball, n minus one over n. So we have proved, we have a quick proof of the isoparametric inequality with this uh, one Minkowski inequality. And we also get the equality characterization because we see here. So the only time we applied an inequality was at that level here when we applied the Minkowski inequality. So we see that this piece is here with equality. And only the two sets that we consider now, which is the body K and the Euclidean unit box with um, equality, if and only if these two things are uh, homothetic, which means, of course, with equality, if and only if K is a ball. Not necessarily with radius one, but uh, with some radius. So that gave us a quick um, proof of the uh, isoparametric inequality, which, uh, as you know, of, of course, is one of the uh, important inequalities in geometry with uh, applications uh, everywhere in mathematics. Um, good. So now um, I'll uh, maybe uh, start erasing over there. Okay. Yeah, it is a so it's, ah, okay, it's a double purpose.
So, so far, so good. Um, so we have volume, we have surface area, and of course, surface area is a natural and important notion, but, um, and there is this important isoparametric inequality associated with it, but um, we also know that surface area is not an SID variant. That is, it's not invariant under FI transformation. And um, such FI in invariance, so uh, FI invariance, so are very useful quantities. In all areas of mathematics. So we ask ourselves, can we find a notion for question? Can we find a notion of surface area? What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean a notion that kind of uh, keeps uh, the nice properties of surface area intact, but is in addition, as an invariant means, um, so very good. Uh, so T is uh, a map from Rn to Rn uh, is an Fn invariant. If T is of the form A plus some vector of little a, I think it's an Fn map. Right? Just uh, F an invariant map, yeah, or oh. is an F an invariant, yeah. Oh. But okay, let me write it. Oh. Let me write it oh. here. So uh, a notion of surface area that is also an F an invariant. Okay, let's write F an invariant. Eh? Where uh, T of Rn to Rn, Fn invariant map, and Fn invariant map. If T is of the form of the form A, say, well, now I have used A for the set, but I hope you are not confused. Um, so if T is of the form of uh, a plus capital A plus little a, where A uh, Rn to Rn is a linear map. And typically we will want that the determinant of the map is different from zero in order to not get something trivial, such that the determinant of A is different from zero and A is a vector in R. So it's nothing else but a linear map uh, plus a shift, yeah? So uh, so question, can we find a notion of surface area that keeps the nice properties of uh, surface area that we know of, plus is in addition F and that's the question. And in order to uh, march towards uh, uh, such a uh, notion, um, I'll uh, need to do uh, I'll need to, to, to introduce another quantity first. It is clear that surface area is not F an invariant, right? Uh, like if we take our standard example of the cube again, right? And then uh, let's just apply a linear map T. For instance, uh, let's T. So let's stay in the, in the plane. And uh, uh, if I look at such a diagonal map, uh, uh, T having determinant one, then uh, so here we have one zero one. Then this T maps this square in a rectangle where we have here so zero states because we took a linear map, and here we have an L, and here we have one over L, and we'll see okay. Uh, the volume of this guy here is uh, two times two, which is four. And of course, this guy here also has volume four. This has surface area at two times four is eight. But with this guy here making L as large as I wish, I can make surface area as large as I wish, right? So it's definitely not an SID invariant. 
In the definition of a fine invariant, uh, are you uh, you're not taking determinant to be one? Uh, I'll, uh, to be totally strict, one would have to take the term, uh, determinant one. But I use the term affine invariant map if I say that I'll, you know, not necessarily always mean uh, uh, determinant one. But to be totally strict, I would always have to take determinant one. Absolutely. Okay. So um, in order to uh, march towards getting uh, an answer to this question that we have here, I need to introduce uh, our next object, which um, is... Um, I keep enumeration. This is always contention with my students. They will say I'll never uh, keep track properly of my enumeration. So probably I'm losing already now. Are we at three or at two? Somewhere around there, right? So I need to introduce uh, what is called the floating body and the convex floating body. So what are those guys? Um, before I define them, um, <coughs> um, it's of course, uh, uh, people always have uh, uh, wanted to study objects that float in a liquid. Uh, that goes back to, uh, you know, ancient times, uh, because, you know, you want to ships to go across the ocean and whatnot. So such questions have been around since antiquity. And uh, we are, uh, uh, with the notions that we introduce, uh, kind of, uh, uh, we call them floating bodies because they are related to objects floating in a liquid or floating in water. So um, let me start by the first definition uh, that was given and, and that's the definition of floating body. So definition of floating body, which goes back to uh, Utah, and then Blaske. And uh, Dupont and Plaschke, they were not interested in uh, dimension n, arbitrary dimension. They were only interested in dimension uh, in convex uh, sets uh, k that are in dimension two or in uh, dimension three. But we'll right away uh, write their definition in dimension n. And also they were not concerned about bodies that are not nice, uh, having nice boundary. Their bodies always uh, um, are such that they have C infinity plus boundary. And I'll explain uh, C infinity plus in a moment. So just uh, uh, be patient a little bit, uh, I'll explain it. Uh, it simply means that uh, you don't have any vertices, uh, you are not looking at polytops, you are looking at objects uh, that where the boundary is infinitely many, oftentimes continu continuously differentiable, so to speak. And where the gauss bonnet conformation network is plus mean is positive, strictly positive. So what's the definition of the floating body that Dupont and Plaschke introduced? So, uh, so K, we want to look at K, a convex body in Rn. And we also give ourselves a parameter delta or bigger equal than zero. Then the convex, uh, sorry, the floating body, And I'll use this notation K sub delta, where I put the delta in these square brackets. Is this convex, and that's important here, subset of K um, uh, whose uh, boundary is given. I'll draw a picture in a second. Let me finish uh, writing the definition and then I'll draw a picture. So subset whose boundary uh, is given uh, by the centers of gravity um, um, G of K into H. 
So where H is a hyperplane, that cuts off a set of a set delta, a set of volume delta. Okay. Okay, and center of gravity is what? Let me squeeze the definition here. Center of gravity of K into H is, of course, nothing else but one over the volume K into H. Then comes the interval, comes the interval of over K into H, and you integrate at dx. Now, so that's the definition of center of gravity of this particular one. Good. Now, um, let me draw a picture because this is, you know, um, definition written, but we'll see much better when I draw a picture um, where we see what's going on. Again? What is that? G? G? G. G of K in trade, center of gravity. G is the name center of gravity. I call it G. Yeah. Okay, so what's the picture? So here we'll have our convex body, okay? We look at the hyperplane H, okay? When, and now um, here I have, oh, maybe I, we have color, sorry. Uh, here we'll have K into H, so that's this set here. Right? That is K into H. Well, here in our, uh, you know, two-dimensional picture, it's just this line segment, right? Uh, but in general, it would be if you have an n-dimensional uh, body, uh, you look at the hyperplane, so you'll get an n minus one-dimensional section of the body, right? And then you'll take the center of gravity, which here is just the midpoint. So that is our G that we look at, right? So now we'll take another hyperplane that also here, as I said, this volume that gets cut off um, is delta. So the, the hyperplane cuts off this volume delta, right? Yeah, good. Now we look at another hyperplane that also cuts off delta. We will take the center of gravity of K into H for this hyperplane, and we'll get another G here, and so on. And we'll look at all, kind, uh, all such hyperplanes, and then, um, the uh, you know uh, boundary of the uh, collection of all these uh, centers of gravity that gives us our floating body, right? As defined by um, Blaschke and Dupont. In this okay. case, is it always the midpoint? Is the center of gravity always the midpoint? Is this case? In in this two dimensional case, it's always the midpoint. Yeah, but in higher dimensions, it's you know this interval expression, right? Um, so, is this the reason that you are taking uh, uh, smooth bodies because uh, for triangles this is not well defined? Very good point. That this definition begs, of course, our first question: Does this, uh, you know, floating body always exist? That, that's the first question. So, does K delta always exist? And uh, as you just mentioned. That's not always the case. Um, so the answer is no. Um, so this is not the case. If we take a triangle, as it was just mentioned, then uh, I managed to. Uh, if we take a triangle in the plane, then um, the this object here is that is the uh, uh, object described by looking at all these centers of gravity looks like so. So it looks like, uh, like so. Yeah, essentially here a bit more. So that would be uh, this uh, uh, configuration is the center of gravity, it describes the centers of gravity. Why? Well, um, maybe I will use another color. Green, why not? Um, no, green's bad because, oh no. Um, so we have our first type of lane H that cuts off delta, and that is our center of gravity, that is the midpoint of H into K. Then, as the hyperplane moves up here, 
our center of gravity will move along this line here, or along this uh, curve here. Till we reach that point, that corresponds to our hyperplane that cuts off uh, delta going uh, through one cord. Then as the, we move on with the hyperplane, our, uh, this way and this way, our uh, curve will go along here till we reach this uh, deepest point here, which corresponds to the hyperplane parallel to that uh, side here, cutting off delta and so on, right? So um, we see this uh, floating body given by um, the definition by Blaschke and Victor does not necessarily exist. And so of course, then the second question is, question two, when does this uh, Victor uh, Blaschke floating body exist? And we'll uh, see uh, uh, one instance or two instances when that is indeed the case. So this definition is not good for our purposes because, uh, well, first of all, this uh, floating body does not always exist. Uh, so we want to uh, reconsider the definition and try to find something that always exists uh, 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 and is convex uh, so uh, that it can serve our purposes uh, uh, within the realm of convex. But before I do that, um, it is of course clear, uh, or let me just say um, why uh, they gave, uh, uh, Dupont and Blaschke gave this notion the name of floating body. Uh, that uh, is because an object that comes from the so name floating body comes from. Archimedean principle uh, an object floating in water, say, always has a set of a set of equal volume. Above the water surface. And so here we'll have the body K, it floats in water. So here is our water body given by this hyperplane H, and it's uh, this uh, uh, fixed volume delta that's above the water surface, regardless, you know. Uh, how the body moves around in the water or how you move the water around the body, right? In this case, we would kind of move the water around the body. Good. So now I'll uh, give... Uh, is it, yeah? Is it necessary that uh, in the definition, uh, do we want the intersection to be always convex? Is it okay to think of intersections with other objects? Perfectly reasonable question, uh, but um, I... And, uh, uh, we thought about that, uh, so, so one could, uh, you know, say, oh, why uh, perfectly fine that it's not convex, right? But then it's difficult for our purposes to, uh, uh, what, what we want to do for our purposes, which is looking at volume, right? So, uh, so how do you count volume for this object? Like you could say, okay, this part here gets allocated positive volume and that negative volume. And uh, then, uh, uh, but, but then that's this particular case of the triangle, it gets much more complicated because you can get all kinds of configurations if, if you do such a thing. So it's not practical for the, this kind of purposes that we want to do. We really want to stay in the realm of convex world. A follow-up question. Couldn't you take the convex hull? Uh, one could take the convex hull, but... Uh, mm, one could take the convex hub, but I think uh, that also might be uh, for the purpose of things we want to do, might uh, uh, create potential uh, difficulties. As delta increases, mm -hmm. the convex hull of this net will become too big. And uh, what we have to do, what we 
Not, not only that, I mean, how, how do you what, track the volume of the convex exactly hull? Exactly, we, want, we what, want to measure the volume of the convex hull. This is what we want to do eventually. We want to get an object, exactly the point. We want to get an object that, um, you know, what was our question? Our question now is get a notion of surface area that is, uh, you know, also uh, affine invariant. And uh, we want to use the idea of Minkowski as a surface area, as a definition of volume. So we want to bring in volume for the objects that we are studying. And um, as uh, Povi made a good point, if we take the convex hull, which one potentially could, very difficult probably to get a handle on the volume of this convex hull, right? And uh, there is a much easier solution, which uh, I'm going to write next, which is the modify the definition of the floating body in such a way that the object that results is always convex. And that's what we are going to do next. So this is the definition. Um, so here we'll have definition of floating body. And now we look at definition of convex floating body. And this definition was independently introduced by Barani and Lahman. and by Carsten Schick and myself. So uh, again, we'll have um, K uh, convex body in Rn. And we'll uh, take a uh, uh, delta that is positive. And I also should say here, um, which I didn't say uh, before, I wish I should, have probably, of course, we don't want the delta to be too large uh, so that we cut off uh, that, that there is nothing left, right? So delta should be smaller or smaller equal than half the volume of the body in question, right? So uh, then the convex floating body, this object that we are introducing now, is always convex, so convex floating body. And in what follows, it's always this one that we'll be using. So I'll eventually om omit the term convex and just say floating body for this object that I'm going to introduce now. So the convex floating body, I'll denote it by K delta without the brackets, is the intersection of all half spaces, just defining hyperplanes. Similar like what we have done here, hyperplanes cut off a set of body delta. Okay. I'll draw the picture here. So how does that look like now? Here is again our convex body K. As before, we'll take a hyperplane H that cuts off delta. So here we have hyperplane delta. So actually, this hyperplane subdivides the our uh, uh, Rn into half spaces. Uh, H minus I call this one, and the other one I call H plus. So if I now want to formally write the definition of the floating body, then K delta is the intersection of all H plus, so that H minus into K is equal to delta. So I look at the hyperplane H that cuts off delta here. We'll have these two half spaces, H plus and H minus. I look at another hyperplane that cuts off delta and a third one. And then we'll take uh, the intersection of all these half spaces H plus and of course, uh, what we'll get is a convex set as the arbitrary intersection of convex sets. So uh, this K delta is always convex. Okay, 
And uh, right away, what do we get for the triangle in the plane? T, right, use T for all kinds of things, for uh, linear maps uh, and FI maps and for a triangle. So, um, but I hope it's not too confusing. So for, we have seen that the floating body was this thing here, and the convex floating body now is simply, um, you know, that part here without the, so to speak, excess parts here. So that is the floating body of the triangle. Okay, so now what do we do with this? Uh, uh, let me first try it, um, what actually uh, Laske uh, did with this. But before uh, I get there, I want to know that there are extensions of this idea of floating bodies. So here we'll have it defined for convex bodies. Here we have it defined for convex bodies in Rn, but there have been extensions of floating body to uh, first the, um, the complex setting. That is CN. And that was done by uh, uh, A. Barrett and Tori Gupta. Actually, I'm involved in the. Uh, so I have some related work, but I'm not involved in the formulation. That is really a paradox. But you have worked with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah but still, so, yeah. so you have worked with it. No, no, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> you should. No, no, no. <laughs> and then um, there are extensions to uh, spherical and hyperbolic space. And that was done by um, um, Beza and myself. And then there um, are um, extensions to a functional setting. That was done by my former student, Ben Lee, and uh, Carsten Schick and myself. Okay. So um, now, uh, I think yeah. in the smooth case, they are still different, is it? The uh, convex floating. Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it's even in the smooth case, it's like so that uh, the, um, this need not always exist. Okay. Because you can think of like, uh, uh, it, it exists always if the body is C2 plus, and I'll mention that in a sec, if body is C2 plus, and if delta is small enough, then it exists. If it exists, then is it equal to, if it exists, is it equal to this uh, second definition? Yes, yeah. Okay. And I'll mention this, uh, that's basically the question two. Did I write somewhere in the question two? Or, or did I lost? No. Uh, it, so we, it's a question middle, one. Middle, middle, middle board. It's on the middle, the middle top board and the top one. Question one, it does it already. And then on two, ah, oh, yeah, here, yeah, thanks. And um, and I erase here. Um, but then our question is, um, when should I when should I stop? Would you tell me when I should have uh, around twelve minutes? Left. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so let's right away address these questions of, so two questions, uh, uh, answers to questions. Um, so uh, the first one I want to mention is a theory by uh, Mathieu Miller and Shlomo Reisner, which says that if K is a symmetric convex body, So 
and I'm writing what it means to be symmetric. And I always mean maybe I should write zero symmetric right away. So if k is a zero symmetric convex body, that is k is equal to minus k. Like all these examples that we have had, <laughs> it's floating away. <laughs> And like the examples that we have had, the uh, L2 ball, right, and the infinity ball, those are both the uh, Then Mathieu and Shlomo showed that um, K delta, this floating body exists. And in fact, we have what uh, we already mentioned. And this floating body is equal to the convex floating body. And there is another result by Blaschke. And of course, Blaschke, uh, as usual, is only interested in dimension two and three. But it's true in general. If k is c2 plus, and I still have not told you guys what c2 plus is, I eventually, believe me, I eventually get there. So if uh, it is c2 plus, um, then, um, uh, and delta is what I already said, and delta is sufficiently small. Enough. Then uh, k delta this exists and is equal to also our. Um, so uh, those are these results uh, that we have. And um, let me now, now uh, write. Uh, a few more properties of this floating body. Mm -hmm. Can I raise up there? Um, obviously, um, so here is the definition. Obviously, well, we have seen. Okay, let me write obvious things first. So, obviously, k delta is a subset of k. And um, if delta is equal to zero, which uh, is perfectly okay to look at, then uh, we don't cut off anything, so we'll get the body, right? So k zero is equal to k. And uh, also, um, uh, uh, we said that delta should be uh, small enough so that uh, we do not end up with the empty set. And actually, one can show that there is a delta zero positive such that uh, k down to zero, that is how far one can go and one ends up uh, consists of, a pro of just one point. So uh, it is always a delta zero which tells you how far you can go. And if the body is uh, zero symmetric, then this uh, point uh, k delta zero will of course be zero. And uh, the delta zero will be one half the volume of k, but it need not necessarily be one half the volume till you uh, till you reach this point. For instance, if for the triangle, the delta zero is uh, strictly smaller than one half the volume. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that k delta is not only convex. Actually, one can show it is strictly convex. That is, the boundary does not contain any line set, so it is really nice. Uh, that was shown by Carsten and myself. And um, um, maybe I write one more. I want to do two examples. You know, I want to look at what's happening for our standard examples that we always look at, which is the infinity unit ball and the um, Euclidean unit ball. So uh, the Euclidean unit ball will actually be more important for us. Um, and I guess I should finish. Um, so let me just um, write.
writes down what you can expect uh, for the floating body uh, in the case of the two-dimensional uh, L infinity ball. And um, the uh, floating body will look like so. I'll write down the equation of the boundary curve uh, in the first quadrant. It's enough to look at the first quadrant because of uh, symmetry. It will be the same in the other quadrant, so it is one minus delta over two, one minus x for uh, uh, zero smaller or equal than x, smaller or equal than one minus delta over two. So, um, so that is the boundary curve that's given to us uh, for the uh, L infinity unit ball in dimension two. We can explicitly show what it is. And uh, then I guess next next time I'll be um, we'll try to describe the uh, floating uh, body of the Euclidean unit ball in dimension n. And, and uh, of course, because Euclidean unit ball, I'll take the unit ball. It's the same if we would take a ball with radius r. But in uh, the uh, uh, two unit ball has of course all the symmetries that we want. So. Uh, the uh, floating ball of the uh, L2 unit ball will, of course, be again a ball, and we'll have to figure out what's the radius of this ball. And then we'll do some computations uh, towards the direction of defining a notion of surface area. Now, involving a derivative, um, also a derivative of volume, but now involving the volume of the body and the volume of the flow. And that we'll do tomorrow. So, thank you very much. Are there any questions? As far as question goes, mm -hmm. from positive angles, we have examples of bodies for which uh, you know the case you must see coincides with the convex flow. Mm -hmm. You have seen that for a triangle that is not true, right? Right. So are there general classes of objects for which question two is the answer is no. Ah, so so you want to kind of uh, so to speak find when does it not happen that the two coincide? Yeah. Um, this is um, I I guess that will be very uh, involved to study uh, and even in dimension two it may not be easy to answer but it's definitely an interesting question to check out. Are there uh, non quantitative instead of having a class, but maybe some other like maybe is dense in the space of okay? So, very uh, good point as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I haven't thought about it too much because I'll basically concentrate on the convex floating body. Uh, yeah, but, but many uh, questions related to this that are uh, you know worthwhile looking at uh, also from a differential geometry point of view. Uh, about the structure of the floating body. Can I talk about the convex floating body, the dual or the polar of the set? Can I talk about uh, you want to see, see if there is a relation yeah. to make sure that I understood the question. You want to see if there is a relation. So you look at K and you look at the polar, yeah. right? Yes. That's what you do? Yes. And then you look at the floating body and then is there a relation to yeah. some object? Uh, right. There is something, and I have been wondering always about this question for a long time because uh, we'll have a, we have a notion of um, there is a notion which is kind of dual to the notion of floating body which is the illumination body and uh, that notion lended itself to probably having something to do with uh, then looking at uh, uh, having the floating body here, that there might be, so I denote the uh, illumination body uh, with a delta on top. I'll explain what the illumination body is. And the question is, is this guy here, that guy? So that was the question. So I'll explain what's the notion of illumination body. So K is a complex body, then illumination body. So I introduced that at some point. Uh, K delta is the set of all x in our range. 
So that, okay, what do you do? You take an X in Rn, you look at the convex hull of X with a body, and but you look at those axes so that if you look at convex hull of X with a body without K, this is supposed to have volume delta, right? So whereas with the floating body, we chop off a set of volume delta, we, so to speak, add on here a little um, uh, head, a little head with volume delta. And uh, well, here one, whereas it was obvious that the floating body is convex, here one has to work a little bit to show that this actually does give a convex object. And uh, it looks like so. And um, then it seemed natural to me always that, okay, such a relation uh, might hold, which maybe, you know, you have to modify the delta, not take exactly the same. And um, this is not always true, uh, but the two things, one can establish a relation that the two things are close in some uh, distance. And uh, this is in a paper with uh, Olaf Wartholz, or actually two papers uh, Wartholz and myself, where we do express some kind of duality relations between these two objects. Yeah. CO. I think the convex hull, the CO. Ah, this uh, convex hull. Uh, um, is there a relationship to the distance to the boundary function? Like if you take K delta, and the uh -huh. distance to the boundary of K delta to K, is it just delta or? Uh, uh, so, okay. Uh, you mean this is, for instance, in that picture? So he wants, I think he just wants to know that if you take K delta, mm -hmm. can you say something, estimate the distance to the boundary? Oh yeah, one can, if delta is small enough, there is a relation. And um, actually, um, when I write down what's happening for the Euclidean ball, we can see this relation. And it's actually enough um, to more or less compute it for the ball, because what you'll do for a general convex body, um, Let's say for the moment it is smooth enough, but it also works if it's uh, you know an arbitrary convex body. You can always approximate uh, by uh, an ellipsoid, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, you'll get an idea to the distance. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why uh, you know that's for delta small enough, and uh, that's why it's enough to compute this distance for the ball. Mm -hmm. The question which is not very different from what uh, he asked. So let's say if I have a foliation of a convex body. You have a what? A foliation, like a... Um, ah, you, okay, like stacking. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then I want to see like how the K deltas evolve. As Excellent you... question. I would very much like to know that. Um, uh, there is certainly... Uh, so, so uh, I think um, what one could maybe do is, uh, you know, try to find a flow. Uh, from uh, the original body that uh, moves along uh, as delta involves to the various uh, uh, floating bodies uh, along this flow. There are analytical things. You could expect an analytical result which tells you the rate at which it is increasing or something. It is growing, uh, uh, if you manage to write down such a flow, then uh, I guess that would be possible. And uh, I think the uh, what the flow would involve is uh, uh, something like, uh, uh, among other things that also should be present there, is the, the affine curvature. So there has to be some special vector field that you need to be able to identify. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Involving the uh, affine, affine curvature. curvature. Yeah. I mean, there is such a thing as affine flow, but I don't know if that moves along floating bodies. I, I don't know how it's related, but there is such a thing called affine flow. Which is affining bearing, but I don't know how it relates to this. Yeah, there's a chance that that might be. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? So, so if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. If there are more questions, we have a coffee break until ten forty-five.